everyone. Thank you so much for joining us to celebrate Oxbridge Science with our first inaugural uh, Varsity Sci. Uh, this is day three, and today we're having our first block on physical sciences and medical physics. And we have two talks for you right now. Um, I'm Amanda, I'm from the Oxford Physics Society. I'll be handing the Q&A later. So if you have any questions, pop them in the YouTube live stream uh, chat, or if you're joining us on Zoom, you can put them in the chat there as well, or privately message them. Um, and yeah, so let's start with our first talk. We have Jen Allen from the chemistry department uh, in Cambridge. She'll be talking to us about lithium ion batteries and why they don't last, which is a shame because they're a really great tool. Um, so I'll, I'll hand over to Jen. All right, thank you. Uh, yeah, so my name is Jen. I'm a third year PhD student um, in the Department of Chemistry at Cambridge. Uh, and I'll be chatting today about my work using magnetic resonance methods to look at uh, the ways in which lithium ion batteries degrade. So why do we care about lithium ion batteries? Um, in short, they've got a great energy density power and lifetime, which makes them uniquely well suited for all sorts of applications. Uh, and so last year's Nobel Prize in Chemistry actually went to three of the scientists who helped develop and commercialize the technology. Um, in particular, their high energy density makes them well suited for use in cell phones, laptops, and power tools, uh, as well as electric vehicles. Um, and they're also being used today in grid energy storage technology. So this, for instance, would help us store solar energy at night um, and be able to use that energy when the sun is no longer shining. Um, and what I'm showing in the picture here is uh, one of the approximately 4,000 batteries that ends up in a Tesla electric vehicle. All right, so how do lithium ion batteries work? Um, we've got a negative electrode on the left and a positive electrode on the right, and what's sitting between them is the electrolyte solution. So when we want to charge the batteries, uh, we have to use electricity to force lithium ions to travel from the cathode to the anode. Um, but when we want to get that energy back, we can allow those uh, lithium ions to return to the cathode. Um, and as we do this, the electrons will travel as pictured around this external circuit. And so that's what will power our device. Uh, so what I study is the, um, the positive electrode material and how it interacts with the electrolyte solution, so um, that particular interface. Um, and I also study the interface between the anode and the electrolyte solution. So the electrolyte solution that I use is a very common blend of ethylene carbonate and ethyl methyl carbonate as the solvent system. And the source of lithium ions in the electrolyte solution is the salt LiPs6. And the cathode material I study is called NMC, um, and it's called that because it uses nickel, manganese, and cobalt. So the problem with NMC is that these metal ions will all dissolve into the electrolyte solution. Um, and so when this happens, obviously it has consequences with the positive electrode because our material is dissolving. Um, but in addition to that, uh, there is structural degradation that occurs as a result of the site vacancies that are generated by the dissolution of these transition metals. There are also consequences that occur at the negative electrode electrolyte interface. Um, so these uh, dissolved transition metals can travel to the negative electrode and uh, deposit there and cause uh, side reactions that will decompose the solvent. And so these side reactions will cause a uh, capacity loss in the cell, which is why, for example, your phone doesn't hold as much of a charge after a couple of years as it did when you first got it. Now, what's interesting about these dissolved metal ions is they are paramagnetic. So that means that they have unpaired electrons. Um, and molecules with unpaired electrons can have um, unusual magnetic resonance properties. So when I say magnetic resonance, um, probably most people are familiar with MRI or magnetic resonance imaging. So the exact same technology is used um, in an NMR spectrometer, and that just stands for nuclear magnetic resonance. Uh, I also use what's called EPR, or electron paramagnetic resonance, to study these systems, um, although today I'll just be highlighting the NMR and the MRI. So you can think of my NMR spectrometer as essentially a sideways MRI instrument uh, with a much smaller bore. So instead of fitting an entire person, I can fit a sample that's about a centimeter across. So how do these magnetic resonance methods work? Uh, so hopefully we're all up to speed that all atoms have nuclei. Now some nuclei have an intrinsic magnetic property called spin. 
So that's an intrinsic property, just like how mass is an intrinsic property. When we place them in a magnetic field, spins will rotate around the field direction to give a small net magnetization along the field. So what I mean by that uh, is that these spins can either be rotating around uh, in the, the positive direction or in the negative direction. And we have a small surplus um, of spins that are in the, in the positive or the up direction. And so as a result, we get this magnetization M0, which is in the same direction as the applied field B0. So that's great. Um, now we have sort of this uh, consistent magnetization for our sample. But to be able to measure anything meaningful from this, we have to separate it from the much, much larger applied field B0. So to do this, we can use tailored radio wave pulses that can sort of tip that magnetization into the transverse plane and allow for signal detection. And the reason that this uh, method is so widely used is because nuclei that are in different chemical environments will respond to that applied magnetic field differently. So for instance, we can discriminate between hydrogen and water and hydrogen and fat with MRI. So after we've applied that radio pulse um, and we've tip our net magnetization into that transverse plane, after some amount of time, it'll go back to where it started in alignment with the field in a process called relaxation. So we've excited it, um, and then some, after some period of time, it will return to essentially equilibrium. So relaxation is caused by these small, randomly fluctuating magnetic fields that'll undo the effect of the radio pulse. And what I mean by that is we can think of all these nuclei and all of these little spins um, as very, very small bar magnets that are just tumbling around in solution. And so as this happens, as these magnets um, are, are passing by each other, um, they, they'll interact with each other and create these small magnetic fields. And so we distinguish between two relaxation phenomena. There's longitudinal relaxation, which is when we regain magnetization in the Z direction. And then there's transverse relaxation, which is when we lose magnetization in the X, Y direction. So electrons have a uh, spin as well. And electrons actually have much larger magnetic fields. And so as a result, when we have these molecules with unpaired electrons, they can induce distinctly fast nuclear relaxation rates um, in any of the nuclei that are uh, close to these um, unpaired uh, these centers with unpaired electrons. So the intention um, of using this um, magnetic resonance method to study lithium ion batteries is that I was hoping I could take uh, an electrolyte sample that has some amount of dissolved metal in them, um, and I would be able to distinguish between a sample that had dissolved metals in it and a sample that didn't have dissolved metals in it on the basis of these relaxation rates. So what I'm showing here is um, the, the composition of the, the samples that I studied. So uh, the, about 92% of, of the molecules in my sample were composed of these the solvent molecules, ethylene carbonate and ethyl methyl carbonate. And then about 8% of the molecules in my system were LIPX6. So that's the salt present at one molar concentration. And then into this solution, I spiked it with transition metals. Um, and so I tried to do this at a concentration which is more or less realistic with what we see in batteries. And so to be consistent with that, um, I added these transition metals on the order of 0 to 0.07%. So it's really only a very, very small amount of transition metals that are needed to cause, um, in some cases, catastrophic failure of the cell. So I had this sample, about half a milliliter of solution with, you know, say 0.01% manganese in it. Um, and my question was, I know on the basis of the theory that this manganese will be having some sort of effect on the surrounding nuclei um, in this electrolyte solution, but on a practical level, is that something that I'll be able to detect? So I started off by doing lithium phosphorus and fluorine NMR, because these are the atoms that are present in my LIPF6 salt. Um, and so what I'm showing in that first row is the, the NMR signal. Um, and then uh, what I'm showing in the second and the third rows uh, are the uh, longitudinal relaxation rate and the transverse relaxation rate um, that were associated with, uh, with these signals. And so there's three things that really jump out at me when I look at uh, this figure. The first is that as I increase the concentration of the transition metals in the electrolyte solution, the relaxation rate increases. Um, and it does so in a linear fashion. Uh, so that's great because it means that um, I can hopefully take an electrolyte solution where I don't know the concentration of metals 
measure the relaxation rate, and then be able to calculate uh, what is the concentration of metals in that solution. Um, the second thing that's apparent is that the manganese relaxation is a lot faster than the nickel relaxation, which is a lot faster than the cobalt-induced relaxation. And so I'll just highlight that the, all of the um, manganese data sets are plotted onto the axes on the right. Um, and so in the case of the longitudinal relaxation, this axis is 10 times larger. Um, and in the case of the transverse relaxation, this axis is actually 100 times larger. Um, so we can see that, for instance, the fluorine um, manganese uh, R2 is 100 times faster um, when we add uh, the manganese than when we add the nickel. And so having this much stronger effect when we add manganese versus nickel or cobalt tells us that uh, the, the limit of detection will be much, much lower when we use manganese. The method will be much more sensitive to manganese than it will be to cobalt. Um, this does make sense uh, considering the electronic structures of these molecules because manganese has five unpaired electrons, whereas nickel and cobalt only have two and three unpaired electrons, respectively. And lastly, the other thing that's apparent is that the fluorine uh, relaxation rates are a lot faster than the phosphorus relaxation rates, which are a lot faster than the lithium relaxation rates. So again, this can tell us something about the, the limit of detection and what's the best way to go about this method. Um, so if I wanted to, to guess how much manganese was in my solution, it would be much uh, easier to do so by taking a fluorine measurement than by doing a lithium measurement. Now this also tells us something about uh, how these metals are actually coordinated in solution. So the effect of these uh, paramagnetic centers occurs through space, meaning that a nucleus that's really close to that manganese will be affected much more strongly than a nucleus that's very far away. And so from these results, we can see that the manganese should be coordinated something like this, where it's very close to the fluorine atom, um, and as a result of that is also pretty close to the phosphorus atom, but it's a lot farther away from the lithium atoms, or the lithium ions. Now this makes sense from an electrostatic argument because we can see that the manganese 2 plus and the lithium plus would be repelled by each other, whereas the manganese 2 plus and the PS6 minus should be attracted to each other. So then we also looked at the proton NMR, um, as in uh, the, the, the proton environments that are present in the solvent system. So in this case, we get four different peaks in the NMR spectrum, and that's arising from the four different proton environments that we have. The one proton environment is on ethylene carbonate, and the other three proton environments are on that ethyl methyl carbonate. And so again, as before, we see that increasing the concentration of the transition metal in the electrolyte solution will increase our relaxation rate. Um, and the nickel, or sorry, the manganese is inducing um, a stronger effect than either the nickel or the cobalt. Now, what's interesting in this case is we can see that uh, the first, second, and third um, uh, proton environments here, um, the ones that are between uh, 2 and 6 ppm um, on, the, on the chemical shift axis, these all relax um, at more or less the same rate. However, if we look at that last proton environment here in the purple, um, which is corresponding to the, the CH3 on the ethyl group of the MC, what we can see is that the relaxation rate is a lot slower than it was um, for the other three proton environments. So because these, um, the, the methyl, uh, the CH2 ethyl and the CH3 ethyl here in blue, green, and purple are all on the same molecule on the ethyl methyl carbonate. We can compare these relaxation rates to get an idea of how the transition metals are solvated um, uh, by that molecule. So what I mean by that is we would expect to see the transition metal be coordinated at the carbonyl oxygen so that it's uh, roughly equidistant from the methyl group and from the CH2 ethyl. However, it would be significantly farther away from that last proton environment, the CH3-ethyl, and so as a result, we would see um, a smaller relaxation effect um, in, in that case, which is what we do see. So what I'm showing here is that this NMR method is uh, suited not only to the quantification of these transition metals, and we can actually detect them in the electrolyte solution, even at these really, really low concentrations, but also this method can tell us something about how these transition metals are solvated, um, and that can give us an idea of why they're dissolving in the first place. So lastly, I want to talk a little bit about imaging, so MRI. Um, so we can do what's called relaxation-weighted imaging. And so relaxation-weighted imaging is a process where um, 
instead of taking the, the, the normal MRI um, image of our sample, we can weight the intensity of the signal within that image based on how fast each pixel or each signal is relaxing. Uh, so what I'm showing here, this diagram on the left, is uh, an experimental setup I did to test if this uh, MRI would be suitable for these battery electrolyte samples. So I wanted to see if I could get sufficient spatial resolution and sufficient contrast between um, different electrolyte samples. So I took seven capillaries and I filled them with seven different electrolyte solutions containing nickel or manganese. And I took a cross-sectional image through the XY plane here. And so this is the result I got. This is uh, the transverse weighted uh, proton image result. Um, and each of these capillaries is uh, 1.5 millimeters in, in width. Uh, so each of these circles um, in, in real space corresponds to one and a half millimeters. So what we can see here is that we can very easily distinguish between each of the seven different tubes in space um, and, and get resolution on the order uh, of of micrometers. Um, but in addition to that, uh, we can see a, a difference between the intensity of the signal. So the way that this um, image uh, works essentially is that a stronger signal is um, corresponding to a, a redder intensity, um, which means that it has a slower relaxation rate. Whereas the uh, weaker signals are represented here by bluer colors. Um, and that corresponds to a faster relaxation. So for instance, the capillary in the very center of the image would correspond to the sample that had no transition metals in it, um, whereas uh, one of the capillaries to the right of that sample, uh, which are much more yellow in color, uh, correspond to some of the samples that have uh, some nickel and manganese in them. And so, this was promising, and I wanted to translate these results into an actual battery that we can put inside the magnet um, and, and operate while it's inside the magnet. So what I'm showing is a, uh, a specialized battery that we've uh, made within my group to be used for MRI purposes. So it's similar to a normal battery, uh, quite like the diagram I showed you at the start, if you just turn that on its side. Um, but instead, the components, none of them can be magnetic, because of course it's going into a magnet. Uh, so in this case, the cell casing is made of Teflon in this image, and we're now working with um, an updated uh, battery model, which has a casing made of plastic. Um, and we also use a larger electrolyte volume than you might realistically see, because this gives us more samples to work with. And so we would put the electrodes at the top and bottom of that interlectured space. So uh, I took uh, this cell and I filled it with water and I took a cross-sectional image um, so through this uh, Z direction, a slice in that direction, um, when, I, when I filled the cell with water. Um, and what we can see is that when the cell is just filled with something that's not paramagnetic, we can get a really crisp image of the inside. Um, and that signal is, is very Z, which means that it's relaxing quite slowly. So water will have a relaxation time that's on the order of a few seconds. However, when I fill the cell with an electrolyte solution that contains five millimolar manganese two plus, um, and I put some real electrodes um, with inside of the battery, uh, we can see that the signal gets a lot weaker, um, meaning that it's relaxing a lot faster. And that's consistent with the measured relaxation rate for this sample, which is about 30 milliseconds. Um, and in addition to that, it's a bit harder to see the top and the bottom boundaries um, of the electrolyte volume. And there's also this sort of uh, rippling um, artifact that we see in the image. And so these uh, effects are coming from the presence of those uh, electrode materials, um, in particular because they are cast onto foil backing. And so that can mess with the image a little bit. However, what this is showing is that we can take uh, a battery that um, can do electrochemistry inside the magnet, fill it with um, our, our paramagnetic containing sample, um, and we can then distinguish it from a non-paramagnetic counterpart. So what we hope to be able to do with this method um, is induce transition metal dissolution and transition metal deposition, and be able to measure that um, with, this, uh, with this method and get a sense for what are the, the charging protocols that will cause transition metal dissolution. So what what kind of voltage do we charge it to to see these problems showing up? 
can we visualize concentration gradients as they form between the um, both electrodes? Um, and lastly, we hope to be able to use this method to evaluate uh, new solutions towards preventing transition metal dissolution. So if we coat that positive electric material with some kind of polymer, will that help you know, the, the manganese stop leaching out of it? Um, and so the, uh, the, the goal of this work then is to be able to prevent this transition metal dissolution problem and then hopefully achieve cells that have a, a longer uh, lasting lifetime. So with that, I'd like to thank the postdocs, Chris and Evan, who's helped me with the NMR and the MRI, uh, as well as my supervisor, Claire Gray, um, and all of my funding sources. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Jen. That was really great. Um, lithium batteries are everywhere. And um, it's so upsetting when you have a perfectly functioning phone, for example, and just you have to give it up because the battery is dead and you can't get a replacement. So this is really important work. And as you said, um, we're also planning to use them in, in, in vehicles in the future and the electric cars would just be so nice, wouldn't they? But uh, right now it seems like they're, um, the main problem there seems to be with the battery. So uh, thank you so much for your talk. Um, so if you have any questions to our audience, I know we have a couple of people watching on YouTube live stream and a couple of people here on Zoom. Uh, you can just message them in the chat. Uh, also feel free to send them to me um, privately, which you can do on Zoom, uh, and I'll take them. Let's see. Uh, right. We have one question here uh, on Zoom uh, on kind of who's asking about the general lifetime of the lithium-ion battery. So you talk about uh, measuring the degradation. Um, are we talking about months or years here? And does it depend on the battery? So it does depend on the battery chemistry for sure. Um, when we talk about what is the lifetime of a lithium ion battery, actually we're able to achieve, um, you know, commercially these, these state of the art batteries will last for, for years. And that's actually something that can sometimes be challenging in studying lithium ion batteries. You know, how can we tell whether we're successfully preventing degradation when it'll maybe take 10 years for this battery to start to fail. Um, and so part of what will control how fast a battery will fail is uh, the conditions um, under which we're charging it. So if we you know, put our battery in an oven and we're always charging it to really, really high voltage, then it'll start to die faster. Um, and so that's why we'll often use uh, sort of more harsh conditions in the lab to be able to induce this uh, degradation where actually on a practical level, um, you know, your, your phone can last for a couple of years and, and an electric car, these are uh, designed to be able to last for a decade. So um, what we have now is, is pretty good, uh, but of course we're always trying to work towards something better. Great, thank you. Um, keep the questions coming. Um, good. Oh, here's one, um, another one on Zoom, um, asking about why lithium ion batteries are dangerous. We often hear like, I, no, I think there was a Samsung phone a while ago that was um, um, had to be called back because of explosions of the battery. Um, is that somewhat related to what you were talking about? So the reason that these lithium ion batteries can be dangerous is um, if we think of, uh, how we charge the battery, we are forcing the lithium ions to go from the positive into the negative electrode, um, and we're storing up this energy because that's not where the lithium ions want to be. And when we discharge the battery, we let the, uh, the lithium ions go back where they want to go, and then we are forcing those uh, electrons to travel around the external circuit. Now, lithium ions can be really dangerous if we have a short circuit. And so a short circuit is a way um, outside of that um, you know, intended external circuit where the electrons can flow. So for instance, uh, if we have something that uh, will create some sort of electrical connection between the negative electrode and the positive electrode, um, then that can cause a short circuit where all of these electrons all at once um, will try to get back to where they wanna go, where they started off. Um, and one way I've heard it expressed pretty well actually is any system where you're storing a large amount of energy is in its own way, kind of like a bomb, um, because we've, we've got the capacity for all this energy and that's what we're going for, but that is also in a sense that makes it hazardous. Um, and then the reason that these batteries can then catch fire 
is when we're channeling all these electrons through this short circuit, um, that, that'll create um, you know, heat. Um, and in particular, the liquid electrolytes that we use in batteries today, that like the ethyl methyl carbonate and the ethylene carbonate, these solvents are particularly flammable. Um, and so then that's why when we have a short circuit, these cells can catch on fire. Uh, so there are a few different methods that people are working on to be able to prevent these um, you know, thermal runaway events where the batteries catch fire. So one idea, for example, is using um, a solid ceramic electrolyte instead of using a liquid electrolyte so that we can mitigate the possibility of uh, the electrolyte catching fire. So that's uh, a different way through which batteries, batteries can fail, and that's something that's a lot more catastrophic. Uh, whereas the, the chemical failures um, and decomposition pathways that I study are uh, a bit more subtle and something that kind of um, accumulate over time. Great, thank you. That was very insightful. <laughs> uh, I hope that answered your question. Um, if you're on the Zoom call, um, we don't have too many people on, so if you want to ask a question in person, feel free to unmute yourself and just ask it in person. Um, Nothing right now. Cool. I have a question. Um, it's a bit more of a fun one, less technical. I remember as an undergrad, I had um, the pleasure of having an NMR machine um, for an afternoon or two. And uh, we just went wild and put everything in there. Uh, I remember particularly enjoying putting uh, like a protein nut um, chocolate bar in there and just being able to see the layers. Um, any, any fun stories, anything fun you put in there that it wasn't a battery? Yeah, actually. Um, so not at Cambridge, but the, the last lab I worked in, uh, it was in Canada. And uh, at this university, you know, where we were all putting our batteries in the magnet, there was a, a person, a visitor who would come over sometimes and she would use the machine for her own purposes. Um, and so we'd have to like, you know, leave her to her own devices. And so I asked one day, like, what does she do when she takes over the magnet? Because she doesn't, you know, she's not part of the university. She, uh, she works at a local hospital. And so one of my lab mates told me that actually she was using the magnet to um, image mice. And she had this custom little holder that she would fit into the, the probe and she would like, you know, sedate her mice and then put them inside the magnet. Um, so it's, it's an incredibly robust technique. You know, you can do everything from looking at chocolate bars to looking at mouse brains to looking at batteries. So it's kind of incredible. <laughs> That's a great story. Um, yeah. So to anyone listening, if you ever get the chance to use an animal machine in a lab for anything, just like put something crazy in there. Uh, it's really fun. <laughs> uh, okay, I don't think we've gotten any more questions. Um, so yeah, I think you're easily to find online. So if people, you know, come up with questions later on, I think they'll, you'll be happy to answer questions per email if there's something coming up. Yeah. Um, Great, thank you so much, Jen. That was a great talk. Um, thank you. Our second talk um, is from uh, Peter, who's um, doing his DPhil in physics here in Oxford. Uh, hi there. Um, hi, hello, hi. Good to be, have you here. Um, so you thank you very much. Ultra cold atoms to study uh, many body quantum systems, which. Uh, yeah, that is correct, yeah. Which we all know, many body quantum systems are really hard to, you know, grasp with maths. We know that, you know, if you have one particle, that's easy. But once, you know, you have, you actually want to look at a system that's more complicated than that, it gets complicated really quickly. Um, and ultra cold atoms are a great way to have a control environment to actually look at uh, these sort of systems. So we're excited to have you here to talk a bit more about uh, your work with ultra cold atoms and kind of how you get them and why they're such a great um, place to look into this problem. Um, yeah. Can you try your slides? See if you have access and everything? Yeah. That, look, that looks good. I think you should be able to see this now, maybe? Yeah, that's looking great. Um, OK, amazing. All right. Uh, I'll so post Q&A later. So um, everyone yes. listening, feel free to put questions in the chat, send them to me privately, and I'll read them out later. Um, the stage is yours. Amazing, thank you very much, Amanda, for this kind introduction and uh, and, and welcome everyone in the, yeah, interested in this talk. Thank you very much for coming. So I'll, I'll be talking about, and Peter, you has, and uh, I'm doing my uh, DFD in Oxford, as Amanda said, but 
previously to that, I did my undergrad and, and master's in Cambridge. So uh, for me, diversity science in Poseum is a, is a home field for both institutions. So that's a, that's a very nice thing to be able to, to come to. And, uh, and this time I will be, I'll be talking about my DFA research, which is on neutral atoms, as Amanda said. And uh, the sort of subtitle I gave to this is, is quantum physics with the coolest stuff in the universe, in a sense that the coldest stuff in the universe. So I'm just going to talk about that in a minute. Um, so the beginning of my talk will be a very brief introduction to quantum physics to all those who are, are first year undergrads in physics or have no physics background necessarily, just to sort of, you know, get everyone, everyone on the same page really quickly. And then I'm going to talk about temperature scales and ultra cold atoms in general. What do we mean by ultra cold and how is it the coolest stuff in the universe, uh, which is also sometimes called quantum gases. The ultra cold atoms are sometimes called quantum gases. And then I'm also going to be then talking about the Oxford Erbium experiment. Uh, which is the experiment that we are running here. And then I will be focusing on the actual research that we do with these atoms, which is about dipolar interactions and, and rate of physics. Uh, okay, so uh, what, is, what is quantum physics? Uh, first of all, well, quantum physics is just basically the physics which sort of governs the, uh, the smallest scale. So the sort of like the, the smallest energies and the low temperatures and all this kind of stuff. And, uh, and, and a large part of this was developed by a, a guy called Erwin Schrödinger on the right. Uh, and, and, and you see his famous equation, the Schrödinger equation just below the picture. And uh, it's very interesting because Schrödinger was a, a fellow at Magdalen College, Oxford, when he got his Nobel Prize for all the work that he's done with his done with quantum physics. But and I quote, uh, his position at Oxford did not work out well because his unconventional domestic arrangements sharing living quarters with two women were not maxed with acceptance. So he had to leave Oxford, but anyway, he was good in quantum physics. Um, so getting back to getting back to the physics, uh, quantum physics is basically, you know, like there are sort of like a, a set of features, which is sort of very typical of quantum physics. And one of that is energy and momentum and all the other kinds of uh, uh, distributions and sort of like properties a system might have. Are restricted to discrete values so you cannot you know go with any speed or you cannot go we cannot have like any energy but you can only have like certain energy levels uh, which is something that you can see on the on the bottom left for example like this, this is a particle in the box and it can only occupy some certain energy levels so this is like uh, this is called quantization another well-known feature is wave particle duality it's some, you know you cannot easily tell apart if something is a wave or a particle and indeed indeed, indeed it turns out the two things are actually the same sort of thing. So if you imagine, you know, you have a particle here, but, or you have a wave here, you see this sort of like red signal there, and it sort of corresponds to a particle being smeared out in space. So you can think about this as being either a particle, which is, you know, centered here, or like a wave which is traveling forward. Uh, another important thing, and the sort of like third important thing I should, uh, I should mention is the uncertainty principle that you cannot predict something, the, 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 can you cannot predict a, a measurement value with 100% certainty. You will only be able to say that this is the expected value and this is the sort of like uh, uncertainty around it. And this is, not, this is nothing to do with like how well you can measure something. This is the intrinsic physics is that there will be an uncertainty in, in your measurement outcome. But it is also important to say that this is all valid at the macroscopic scales as well. It's just that this effect is so minor that you don't see this in everyday life. So for example, um, these energy levels are so close to you get the, so that you don't see this quantization in, in, in everyday life because you know you, can, you just cannot tell apart these energy levels at that high energies that you normally encounter. Okay, so this is just a very brief introduction into quantum physics and then let's go now to temperature scale. So what do we mean by cold and, and ultra cold? So I'm sure in a, in a, in a scientific setting, uh, I, I won't need to explain the Kelvin scale. And also I've displayed the, the temperature scale on a log scale. So you know, each division now is like a, a factor of a hundred, you know, and, uh, and sort of like, you know, lecture theater that it would otherwise in normal times would be in probably is about, you know, 20 degrees, so like a couple of hundred Kelvins. And this is here. And on the right, I also display how quickly the atoms move at that temperature. Okay, so if you have something colder, that means that, that, that those atoms move uh, slower. Um, so just like giving an idea about temperature scale, the center of the sun is somewhere there, sort of about, you know, like a million Kelvins or so, and the atoms move at the speed of a rocket, whereas at the lecture theater, they would, speed, they would move at the speed of an airplane, okay? But then if you then go down in temperature to outer space, 
you have, you know, about the background temperature of, of the universe is 2.7 kelvins. And, and that means that, you know, the, uh, the atoms move at like uh, 30 miles an hour or so. It's so sort of like a car. So the question is how cold is ultra cold? So the ultra cold atoms are here, sort of like a couple of hundred nano Kelvin. So this is much, 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 much colder than outer space. And, uh, and the atoms move at, a, at the speed of a snail. And this is literally the coldest stuff in the universe in the sense that we don't know anything, we don't know about anything which is colder. The, uh, the, uh, the, the coldest natural object that we know is, uh, is uh, a gas in space, which is uh, only one Kelvin. So it's even colder than the background radiation, but that's still, you know, six orders of magnitude hotter than the, than the, than the energy scale that we are using in our experiments. Okay. So this is what we mean by ultra cold, you know, just the sort of like hundreds of nano Kelvins or tens of nano Kelvins of regime. Uh, and then why is this interesting or what does this mean from like the particles point of view? Well, so the ultra cold atoms, the, the one of the important features and probably this is the most important feature is that this lambda, so their wavelength, okay, I've, talk, I've talked a little bit about this wave particle duality. So the wavelength of these particles is basically bigger than the interparticle distance. Okay, so then the, the, that means that the particles waves overlap with each other. The atoms move very, very slowly, sort of like a speed of a snail, and they are only a few hundred nano Kelvins cold. And what this means is that the whole thing just becomes a macroscopic quantum system. And this is something called the Bose-Einstein condensation. So when we make stuff colder and colder, essentially we start from, you know, sort of like room temperature, hot gas, which is all governed by Newtonian dynamics. You just have, you know, ideal gas, you sort of like particles, we are like marble balls and all bouncing off each other. And, and, the, and the wavelength, their wavelength is just much smaller than the distance between the particles, you know, the average distance between the particles. And it means that the whole thing can just be described pretty much by, by Newtonian dynamics. Uh, but if you then make it colder and colder, you first enter into the territory of wave mechanics, where, you know, they are already behaving like waves, but they are still not sort of like overlapping with each other. And then if you make them even colder, then the whole thing will, you know, will be, the base will be much longer or the base will be longer than the, than the interparticle distance. So the whole thing will sort of like sink each other uh, into, into, this, into this BEC, this Bose-Einstein condensate. Okay, uh, good. So why bother to, to go this cold and why is this interesting and why is this good? Uh, so I've mentioned, and, and Amanda mentioned, that this is to explore many body physics and, uh, and, and how that is interesting. And the good example in nature is that, you know, if you've seen sort of like geese flying, it's not the same thing as like seeing, you know, 15 geese flying individually. So they arrange themselves into this V shape because the air friction will be lower. So like they save energy in flying this particular shape. The same kind of thing happens with the atoms. You know, if you have more than one atom or like more than a few atoms, then you have this sort of emergent phenomena that you cannot see in, in individual atoms and cannot easily describe. So that's, uh, that's why we go into this. And you know, there are lots of, uh, lots of examples why in, in physics where this can be interesting. You know, this, this happens in superconductivity where all the electrons sync with each other. This happens in uh, turbulence. Uh, how the many particles in, in, well, in our case, the gas or, or in any, anything else sink into each other. But, you know, this also affects uh, quantum computing and, and even the financial markets, you know, can be sort of like described as a many body system. You know, you just have lots of shares flying around and each interact with each other. And, you know, all price goes up, then probably airplane price goes down or that sort of stuff. Good. Okay, so then quickly moving on to the Oxford Airbnb experiment. So basically, we are we are we are creating a gas of erbium atoms, which is uh, which is uh, uh, just a species like oxygen or nitrogen or you know whatever hydrogen, uh, which I will explain later why we use that particular kind of atoms. But basically, we first have an erbium oven. Erbium is a metal, so you first need to heat it up to get a gas, which you can do and which you can then cool down. So we have an erbium oven which heats up the erbium to more than a thousand degrees. Okay. And then we essentially need to cool them, okay? So we, we have lots of different cooling schemes in place, which are all very interesting. We basically use uh, lasers to cool the atoms. And all of this is in a vacuum chamber. So what you see here is this is a large vacuum chamber here, essentially, and this is your oven. And then you first cool them transversely. So the atoms sort of like from this oven fly down here. And so you first cool them in, the, in this direction and then the perpendicular direction, sort of like uh, going this way and then, and then, and then this way. And uh, 
what you then do is that you have uh, something called the Zeeman slower. Okay, so this is just another kind of slowing with another laser with, with, the, with, the, with the same kind of laser beam when you actually start to basically counter propagate the laser. So like your atoms go this way and the laser goes this way and then you sort of like slow it down. So what you then have is then, okay, you slowed your atoms down. You need to then trap them, okay, to make experiments. And this is what we, what we do in this chamber here. So the atoms started here, they get slowed down in this, in this stage as well in, in, in this sort of like Y and Z directions, if you like. In this stage, it gets slowed down in the X direction. And then this stage, they are sort of like stationary enough to be able to be trapped again with, with laser beams. So we use, you know, very colorful sort of like blue lasers in, in, in this bit and then yellow lasers in this bit. And then we have infrared lasers as well. Uh, so in this bit, we trap them in something called the magneto-optical trap. So that's, that stands for MOT. Uh, at this time, but if anyone is interested in these schooling things, I'm very happy to, to talk about that later in the questions. Um, and then I mentioned that we have a, an infrared laser to sort of transport all this from the middle of this chamber into this glass cell here. So we can actually, you know, more easily access our atoms and then more easily, can more easily manipulate them. Okay, and this is what, this is what we call the science cell. It's basically a glass cell. And this is where we cool the atoms down uh, or it's where we intend to cool the atoms down to, uh, to, to form a BEC in a box. Okay, so this is just basically a BEC in a box here. Uh, and an interesting addition we will also uh, want to do later on is to add the second species to our experiment. Uh, so we should also, we would also like to include potassium atoms later on so that we can mix the erbium atoms with, with potassium atoms. Okay, so this is basically the, uh, the, the Oxford erbium uh, experiment. And what can you do with these, what can you do with these, uh, with these atoms? Why they are interesting. So but this is basically how the, uh, the experiment looks like in real life. So we have sort of like two tables, okay, two optical tables. So what, one optical table, you have all this large monstrous uh, vacuum chamber with all your atoms and, 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 and optics around it. And then the other chamber, you have all the nice colorful lasers and, uh, and it's all you know, pretty much lit up and it's just very, very, very nice. And uh, and then you use fibers to uh, to to get your you know, get your prepared laser light, which is you know set at the right frequency and the right you know intensity and whatnot you want to use onto the experimental table where you can actually cool your atoms down. And what you see in the bottom in the middle is a is a guess of of cold atoms, not ultra cold. This is still a sort of thirty micro kelvins hot above absolute zero, but it's still you know, like pretty cold. So uh, so that's a, that's a guess of ultra cold atoms that you can you can physically see. So this sort of rim here, what you see is just a is just a viewport on your uh, on your uh, vacuum chamber. So this is sort of like one inch wide. The case is of like two and a half centimeters wide. And you know, the, the guess in here, so this is like the atom guess here, it's like sort of like a centimeter, right? So you can like, like very nicely see it. And it is very exciting because, you know, you are exploring quantum physical phenomena in at scales that you are used to, in the sense that you can, you can literally see your guess, just like, you know, with naked eye, there is, you don't need a microscope, you don't need sort of like very fancy imaging. Uh, and you can, you, can, you can literally see your, your ultra cold guess. The way you are still achieving to be in the quantum physical territory is that well you have a large uh, length scale for sure but your temperature scale is now very very small so then your energy scales are also very small and then you enter into this this quantum physical regime now I'm going on to talk about more about the the atoms and why we use erbium atoms sort of like you can think the the, inter, the important and then the key uh, key thing here to mention is the is, is interactions you know you want to you want your atoms to interact because if they are not necessarily interacting with each other then like sure you have like they basically have 15 individual gays okay who are not interacting with each other and you know each of them lives their own life and then it and it doesn't matter uh, but if you have interactions between your atoms you can have basically two type of interactions uh, uh, that we explore at least so the, the ba most basic one is contact interactions. That's something which you would have in, a, in an ideal gas as well. Okay, so think like sort of like marble balls bouncing off each other. And you know, this is a short and uh, this is strong band and short range. So, you know, like if the marble balls are far away from each other then they don't interact, if they close to each other and sort of like collide then they do interact uh, and they just sort of like, you know, bounce off each other but it does not have a directional dependence. You know, it doesn't matter which, uh, which side you are bouncing off. And this is also interestingly tunable. So you can, uh, you can tune how strongly they bounce off each other or if they actually uh, attract each other, you can also do the, the other thing, the other way, 
you can you can sell this with a magnetic field, interestingly. But then the reason we are using Erbium atoms is because this is well, this is very sort of well understood now and well explored. But what you can then do is then you can add another sort of interaction on top, which is dipole-dipole interaction. So things sort of like bar magnets essentially. Okay. And this is very interesting because like what this means is that this is long range, you know, magnets interact with each other, even if they are far away, they don't need to be, you know, sort of literally next to each other. And this is also, this also has a directional dependence. If you think about it, basically, if you put two magnets right next to each other like this, they will repel each other. But if they are sort of like one below the other, then they attract each other. So now it sort of like adds another layer of complication to the picture. And this is why we use Erbium because that's very, these dipole dipole interactions are very strong in Erbium atoms. Okay. So uh, what can we do with all these dipolar atoms? So you have well, three elements to choose from so far at least. Uh, because it's very complicated to, to cool atoms down, you can't sort of like, you know, pick and choose and cool anything. But this is, this is, this is in itself is a, is a significant significant bit of research of how to of how to cool uh, an atomic species down. So the dipolar species, which are already uh, made into a BEC, is chromium, dysprosium, and erbium. And you see that, uh, well, this, uh, this 6 mu b and, and 10 mu b and 7 mu b is just basically quantifying how magnetic they are in some sense. Uh, so uh, so dysprosium is, is very magnetic, you know, erbium is sort of like, you know, a middle magnetic and, and chromium is still sort of like fairly magnetic. Uh, for example, potassium, this number would be 0 0.1 or less. So these are these are sort of uh, highly magnetic elements in that sense. And what you can do with them is, is there are lots of lots of interesting and nice emergent physics compared to just the regular contact interactions. Is uh, there is one thing called the D-wave collapse, which just means that okay, you basically uh, what happens if you if you if you make your gas you know sort of like collapse onto each other. Well, if you if we just had contact interactions and then you would have no directional dependence, the whole thing would surely just like collapse in a in a ball-like manner. So like the whole thing would be circular and you sh should see no patterns. But if you make it, if if you if you increase the dipolar interactions and you and you call some cool a, a, a dipolar guess, you see this like nice clover leaf pattern appearing, uh, which is very interesting. And this is because of the of the uh, of the magnetic interactions. You can also make your uh, your magnetic gas into into droplets uh you might have seen or you might have come across these ferrofluids you know sort of like magnetic fluids and then you put a magnet next to it and then it starts to become like spiky and then like it, it goes into droplets you can do this pretty much the same thing with with uh, with, with magnetic atoms or, or or dipolar atoms uh you can also make them into super solids so super solids is a is a is a fancy way of saying a uh, super fluid which is density modulated Density modulation means that you know you just have sort of like a, a, a droplet-like structure. Okay, so this is not sort of like uniform, but you have a droplet-like structure on top of something which is superfluid, i.e., fall, i.e., uh, is uh, it just flows without any friction. And uh, and 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 the basics to all of this, or the basis to all of this, is the Roten spectrum and the Roten physics, Roten energy spectrum, which I'm going to turn to in a minute. Um, so this is something that you can that you can uh, that you can look at with these dipolar atoms. Okay, so there is, as I said, there is a wealth of uh, of, of phenomena that you can you can explore. So uh, the sort of interests of our research group is uh, about rotom physics, which I'm going to elaborate in a minute. So I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but also uh, phase transition dynamics. So uh, what you can think about it that uh, okay, so if you if you cool your gas down to to go in this ultra cold regime, it, does it become sort of like more uh, more segregated in some sense if you if you cool them down quicker? Does it mean that you have these sort of domains and then more domains if you cool them quicker than like if you cool them slower? Is that that's a, that is the question that you would like to see and like how dipole interactions affect that? We also would like to study how the uh, the interactions affect uh, turbulence. So you see that uh, this was done fairly recently in another uh, another set of dipolar atoms. That you see this uh, you see these uh, turbulent cascades essentially appearing in a very nicely ordered uh, ordered fashion. So these sort of like um, dots you see in the middle of your guest is just a picture of a guest and all these dots that you see in the in the picture of your guests are just basically like small turbulences essentially and they are nicely arranged in a in a in a in a in this kind of pattern 
And then what we'd also like to study is impurity physics. So what if you have like uh, a dipolar gas and then you put something which is non-dipolar, potassium in our case, and how, you know, something which is an impurity uh, interacts with your, with your dipolar gas. So as I said, I'm going to explain radon physics a little bit more and what that means. So basically in our, in our experiment, the, uh, the atoms are, are trapped in a pancake trap. Okay, so this is what you see on the right. You basically trap your atoms with two laser beams, one which looks like a tube and one which looks like a sheet essentially. So what, mean, what that means is that you have basically a pancake in the middle and this is where your atoms are. Okay, so all these like areas are your dipolar Arabian atoms and they are all nicely lined up to each other in a, in a pancake style fashion. And the interesting bit here is then if you start to shake this pancake essentially, so you have this pancake and then you just start to shake it, their orientation changes. Because in equilibrium, they are just you know, right next to each other. So they all repel each other. But if you start to shake them, they start to sort of like move up and down and then they start to, uh, they start to attract each other. So what you see here essentially is that on the y-axis, you see the interaction uh, by the excitation energy. And on the, on the x-axis, you see how much you excite them essentially. So, you know, if you have sort of like a, a, a not very strong excitation, that they are still sort of like roughly next to each other. So they all repel, repel each other and you start to excite them more. So that means that their uh, velocity is getting bigger and say so their kinetic energy is getting higher. So this excitation energy curve goes up, but then you start to excite them more. And interestingly, the energy does not go up higher even though their kinetic energy increases, but it goes down actually to this bit here because you know they start to get they start to attract each other this way, uh, and then you know if you start to shake them even more, then obviously the uh, the kinetic energy will take over and then it all shoots up. But what is interesting here is that you get this dip. Okay, so like you would not have such a dip if you had the non-dipolar uh, non-dipolar uh, species because they would not the orientation would not affect their uh, would not affect their interactions. And this is this this dip here is called the roton minimum. Okay, so that is why the whole thing is called roton physics. Uh, it was this is a term uh, coined by uh, Lando, if I'm correct, and uh, and, uh, and but it has nothing to do with anything rotating or anything. It's just uh, it's just a term that he used, and uh, and it's interesting because you know lots of lots of the properties of your gas is uh, is is determined by this energy spectrum. And it, it determines this something called the critical velocity. So like how quickly you need to stir your gas before it starts to, to become turbulent. Uh, and when it starts to lose its uh, superfluid property, uh, it also uh, affects uh, how the, uh, the critical temperature changes in the sense that like how cold you need to make your gas uh, to make it into, into a Bose-Einstein condensate, it also, uh, and, and, and basically just sort of like the, you know, the energy spectrum governs the general, uh, general uh, idea and the general sort of like uh, things you can think about in, in, your, in your guess. I'm realizing I'm running out of time, so I'm going to conclude here with a summary. Uh, so basically, we are using, uh, we are using ultra, we are building an ultra called atoms experiment uh, with a pancake trap. And, uh, and this we use to, to access quantum physical phenomena so that we can uh, cool the atoms down to sort of like 0.1 microkelvins by absolute zero. We also use erbium to make them into, uh, to, to take advantage of the dipole dipole interactions and the tunable contact interactions on top of that. And so we will use the system to, to study rate and physics and the, and the dipole or quantum physics of all these, uh, of, of, of these species uh, generally. Uh, Top bottom right is the is, is my colleagues. Uh, Rob is my supervisor. Rob, Dr. Robert Smith, and uh, and and it's all the rest of the team who is working on this. And with this, I, I thank you very much for your atten uh, attention, and I'm looking forward to taking questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that was that was a great great talk again. Um, I'm so happy that we have a bit of physics represented here um, and our, uh, in this week because. Uh, it's been kind of dominated by biology and chemistry. Um, yeah, so if anyone has any questions, pop them in the chat, both on YouTube and on Zoom, if you're joining us there. Um, yeah, first question here. Uh, why do we use the term roton in that case? I guess it's referring to like the later slide. 
that is that is a good question. That is a good question. Uh, I think the idea was there is that this 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 rate of minimum also appears in liquid hydrogen, which is a, which is a very different kind of system. It is also cold. It is also superfluid, but it is very strongly interacting. Whereas we are talking about relatively lightly interacting uh, systems, and uh, and there it, it was first thought that it has to do something with uh, with stuff rotating. Uh, so that's that's why it's called Rotan, but it is it does not have to. It, 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 in in our usage, we just basically use the same term because the energy spectrum is is is, is similar, and you know, uh, it has the same shape. And uh, but it but it has not it has nothing to do with anything rotating in our case. So this is just a this is just a historical. We use this for historical reasons, as I think is the case in in sciences in many many different uh, many different uh, ways in terminology. Yeah. Yeah, and forever we will use spinning sphere to describe electron with spin. So exactly. it's never going to get rid of it. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. That's a good example as well. Cool. Um, another question on the Zoom. Why yeah. are potassium atoms used in the 2D experiment specifically? Okay, so basically I'll, I'll go back to this that slide there. Um, See, so I think the the uh, so it's a two D two D experiment or three D experiment. So you see that this it says that two D plus mod, and then it says six B mod here. So the whole thing, the, all of these things are still three uh, D. So the uh, the reason we call this a two D plus mod is just because we use four beams, or we will use four beams to cool it. But uh, but this will be a single experiment. So the, what the, what happens here is that the erbium comes from this way to the oven and it travels down here and then it's transported to here, whereas the potassium will start here in this mod. Okay, so it, it, the, the, the potassium mod is here, but whereas the erbium mod is here, and the potassium mod will be transferred from here, down here, and then down there. But the but the potassium will be added on top of the erbium, and the experiment is here. Okay, so there is just one experiment in that sense. Oh, there's just one 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 place where you do your experiments, and 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 the potassium will be will be will be put on there. Now the whole thing is is still relatively two D in the sense that if you if you think about this, I said that this is a this is in a pancake configuration, uh, but this is not uh, strictly two D in the sense that you can you still like shake your pancake. So like you have a pancake gas, but then it it it, sh it is shaken in the in the third direction. Okay, so it's not sort of like a, a pure two D experiment. And, uh, and and this 2D plus just refers to how the how the uh, the potassium is being called. It has nothing to do with you know the dimensionality of, of anything. Cool, thank you. Please tell me you're gonna publish a paper called Shaking Atom Pancakes at some point. Um, we hope to we hope to do that soon, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Oh, we have another question here. Um, yes. I understand how a laser can heat things up, but how could a laser be used to cool atoms? Doesn't it transfer energy? I suppose this is referring to your optical trap. Um, yes. So I so look forward to this question, actually, because I prepared a few slides on it. Uh, that I think is very exciting. And it's something which many people are interested in and looking forward to. Uh, so I'm just going to tell about that a little bit, because uh, that is really exciting, uh, how, how lasers can be cooled down to cool stuff. And uh, the way we normally introduce this is, is with this slide, actually, is that, uh, you know, in the famous movie Goldfinger, Bond says, like, do you expect me to burn? And Goldfinger would say, no, Mr. Bond, I expect you to freeze. And that would be you know, quite a surprise uh, to, to everyone. Um, a really short digression here is just that I've come across this the other day, is that um, Goldfinger, by the way, was named after a, a, a Hungarian architect, Ernő Goldfinger, because Ian Fleming so disliked his buildings that he, he named him the next villain of his movie. So this is one of the buildings of Ernő Goldfinger, and, and Ian Fleming just said that this, this is so bad that he will name him the next villain. Anyway, getting on to the actual question, how you use lasers to, to cool down atoms. So what you do is basically you can think about the, the, the light and, and laser as a, as, as a stream of photons, okay? Which is sort of like light particles in some sense. So then it is, it is, it is more about you have, you, know, you have one particle, like an erbium particle traveling down your tube, and then you have light particles, i.e. photons going the other way. Okay, so and what you basically have is that you, you just make use of a collision essentially, okay? So then the light particle bounces off, or like the photon bounces off your, your atom, and that just slows them down in the direction. So basically what you do here 
or, or you think about how effective is that it's basically but not very effective it's mostly like it's more like you know you have a tank that's your erbium particle and you start to shoot uh tennis balls and then you want to you want to stop a tank with shooting tennis balls but basically that's how effective it is but that, that, that is literally what's happening so that is how you can use lasers to to cool down your atoms now you cannot use any sort of wavelength it's a little bit more complicated than that uh, but that's the that's the basic idea. So that's how you that's how you can cool your atoms down to say 100 microkelvins or so. But that is still actually four orders of magnitude or three orders of magnitude hotter than what you want to be. So what you then do is that you you do another cooling scheme called uh, evaporative cooling. And what this means is that we basically make a, this is basically like a very expensive coffee machine. And this is basically this is this is you know what our experiment is doing. So our experiment is like a one million pounds coffee machine. And what you do essentially is that you you have your hot atoms in a in a cup in a trap in our case, and then you just you just blow the hot and hottest atoms out of your uh, of your of your cup of tea in some sense. Okay, that's how you literally cool a cup of tea. Just like you just blow it and then you blow the hottest particles away. So what you do is that you have your trap here and then your atoms down here. Okay. You have some cold atoms here, but then you have some hot atoms on top. But if you decrease your tap, if you decrease your trap depth, i.e., you know, let the hot particles fly away, then the hot particles will fly away, and you will remain. You you have you will have the less particles, but on average, colder particles in your experiment. And you basically just decrease your trapping potential all the way down, so that you go down to this very 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 cold uh, ultra cold atom gas. But in that process, you actually do lose, uh, I think, 99% of your atoms. But what it means is that we still have like a couple of thousands or tens of thousands of atoms uh, in the ultra cold regime. And, you know, looking at tens of thousands of atoms is still very interesting. It is still like a proper many body system. You don't just have you know, three atoms or whatever left. So this is how you use uh, lasers to, uh, to, to, to cool your atoms down, essentially. Thank you for preempting that question. I think it's something that you get very often. So the way to think about it is if you're worried about uh, where does the energy go for like putting lasers onto atoms, the thing is that the light isn't being absorbed, but it's being scattered. So um, great analogy. Uh, thank you so much. Yes. Um, I guess the, I guess maybe an interesting thing here is that it's just like going back to the this kind of image here just for a second. You know why would uh, why would this beam then you know heat something up and cut it? Well, I think the reason is because like here you have your atoms in a in a crystal or like a sheet or whatever, and your your atoms cannot sort of like fly away in that sense. That it's not that the laser comes one way and the other the atom comes another way and then it slows down. It's just that the atom is held in place in a crystal. Then a laser comes in or like a photon comes in and then it excites it and then so that it, it starts shaking because it cannot sort of go away because it is trapped in that crystal. So the whole thing just heats up and that's how uh, that's how it is different. Yeah. Cool. Uh, again, thank you so much. Um, that was another great talk. Um, thank you to both of our speakers. Um, this was the, um, the block of talks that we're hosting right now. Um, there's still more coming later. Uh, we have um, a talk on conditioning the heart for regeneration um, in a while. And then there's the last block today, which is on the connection between mental and physical health, um, which is something that we know, we've known about for quite a while, but it's really hard for modern medicine to quantify that, to make it useful for practitioners because mental health is, can be quite hard to, um, to quantify because it's so individual. Um, so we have, I think, three talks in that blog, which is interesting, uh, which should be interesting. So I hope to see uh, some of you here who are listening to you right now. Um, I don't think we've gotten any other questions in the meantime. But again, um, the people who talk here, these are super interested people uh, who want to get the word out over their research. So do feel free to send them an email. This is generally a thing that you should know in science. Is everyone wants people to love their research. So um, feel free to contact people individually. Um, one last thing, if you enjoyed these talks, um, in this blog particularly, do check out the Physics Society in your um, university. Uh, I'm on the committee for the Oxford Physics Society, and we currently do um, our talks virtually. So we do talks during term time, at least one every week. And they are currently free and open to everyone because they are on Zoom. So do check us out on Facebook and you know find out if there's a society like that at your university. I'm assuming we have mostly have people from Cambridge and Oxford, but you know we never know. Um, yeah, so thank you again um, to the speakers.
Um, and thank you to everyone listening for joining us. And I hope to see many of you later. Thank you.